Obviously, it's super important in cybersecurity to have real time processing as well. Um, are you able to go into like any particular uh, kinds of infrastructure or technologies or techniques that you employ to handle massive traffic in real time? Yeah, so so we utilize uh, our most uh, direct approach towards real time information is aggregates. Model retraining is something we utilize Airflow to instrument model retraining on a, on a weekly basis because of tr we're trying to take advantage more of customer shifts than attacker shifts. Attacker shifts can happen much faster than that. And so we utilize our aggregate engine for uh, identifying and adapting to attacker shifts. So this is both at the IOC level of trying to, when we miss an attack or if we see a particular IOC within a net new attack that we're, we've caught, now being able to ensure that we catch everything else that has that same IOC. So basically utilizing a combination of abnormality to catch the first attack and then IOC to catch everything else that looks similar to it. We need to very quickly identify, okay, this signal is now something that we've seen in a malicious message. We need to distribute this out to somewhere else. So to make this very concrete, the kind of just to give the situation, then I'll talk about the technology. Uh, so if the attacker has purchased a domain and they're not utilizing that domain to send out messages that include a, a malicious link with that domain, they're, that maybe they send out 100 messages that all include this domain. And maybe we were able to identify that some set of these messages are malicious. And we're able to identify this by looking at the differences between the way that this message was sent and the kinds of uh, messages that the person who's receiving this normally receives. But maybe we don't do that for every one of these 100 messages. Maybe 10 of these messages hit people who are receive a lot of messages that look really sketchy but are, are totally normal. And because of that, we're not able to spot on those 10 people that this message was bad. But we have seen on our other 90 that it was bad because – where the, those were sent to people who receive mainly normal messages. And so now we need, we have this new piece of information, which is that this domain is bad. And we have this message that was, we didn't, we, we wouldn't be able to identify as bad without this piece of information. Now at risk of hitting this uh, user, this individual. So this is a case where we need to react very, very quickly to pull this message and, and stop it from doing damage because we've identified that this indicator of compromise is bad by leveraging this information and now we need to, to act on it. And so we utilize uh, like a Redis-based uh, key value store to track these types of indicators of compromise. And so we stratify based on every kind of decision that our system makes and track each of the different types of indicators of compromise you could extract from messages or sign-ins in this system and utilize a, a triggering replay system to identify based on like a last N aggregate within Redis. When any of these individual counts gets triggered, we then submit from the last N uh, Redis aggregates back to our uh, core reprocessing engine. Very cool. Uh, very cool example. Um, you said you said a term in there, which maybe you did define, and I just missed it. But like IOC, yeah. So indicator of compromise. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you talked about that earlier in the episode, but I wasn't used to it as an acronym yet. Nice. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's such a it's it's an acronym that I'd never heard of before going into the security world, but it's constantly bandied about. Uh, it's it really just means anything that could indicate that something is bad. And generally, it's referring to IP addresses and domains and email addresses and file hashes and things like that. But there's a lot of other things that it could refer to as well. Nice. And so you talked about this a little bit earlier, but maybe we can we can dig into it a bit more. When we talk about real time processing, you've kind of now covered that. Uh, you know, things like this Redis key value store allow you to do that efficiently. Um, and you, pre into pre into previous answers, you talked about. Uh, resilient machine learning being adaptable in in practice how does that mean that you need to be updating your models like is it is there like a routine to updating machine learning models or is it like 
event driven? How, how does that work? So we utilize a, we've built an auto retraining framework that enables us to retrain our models uh, on a regular cadence. We, we maintain a large number of different machine learning models, which we retrain on different cadences. Our auto retraining pipeline covers our, our core models, our most important models that we, we hook up into it. And it's, it's a series of different steps to, to do a auto retraining. First, it's to collect all of the data that we're going to utilize. We need to process it and extract features from that data. We need to actually run the training process. And then the most important stage is evaluation. We need to identify that if we take the model that's currently deployed and turn it off and turn this new one on, we're not going to suddenly flood a bunch of customers with false positives. We're not going to stop catching attacks that we're currently catching. We're not going to dramatically increase our cost or latency or, or anything else. And so we have a large suite of tests that run simulations with this new model in place of the old model. And so this is a pretty heavy, expensive process, which is why we don't set this up for every single model we deploy and only our most important critical models. And this, we for our faster adaptation, we primarily rely on aggregates for capturing changes in data distribution. And we utilize auto retraining as a way to readapt as customer distribution shift over time and uh, take on new signals. Our one thing that's um, relatively interesting about our, our normal process is we are constantly adding new signals. We're constantly identifying what's something, what's a new kind of aggregate to build, what's a new kind of data source to subscribe to, to be able to understand more about the indicators of compromise within emails or sign-in events. What are new ways that we can transform, apply natural language processing, apply clustering techniques to better understand each piece of data that we process. And each one of these signals is something that could be useful in a model retraining. And we set up our auto retraining process so that it automatically consumes certain kinds of signals that the team adds. So we, we have the, we're able to operate in a mechanism where one group is building new signals and then immediately setting up heuristics around those signals to, to utilize this like heuristic kind of models. And the auto retraining process picks up these signals automatically into the models that regularly retrain. And so in, in this way, we are able to most efficiently have this feedback loop between the sort of very hands-on work to optimize a signal so that the signal is powerful enough to work in a heuristic and that signal then being incorporated into our, our next re automated retraining of our, our core machine learning models. Nice. So uh, in the software engineering world, there is a, a term, CICD, continuous integration, continuous deployment. That is, uh, you know, a very common practice these days. And so the analog for what you're describing, could we call that uh, CICT, continuous integration, continuous training for a lot of these core models that are in your auto retraining framework? So uh, to be honest, I would say no. I, I, I generally think of continuous training as being a somewhat separate thing where, where you're really looking at less than a, 10 to 20 minute difference between when a sample shows up and when the weight update has been applied to the model that's deployed in production. At Twitter, the we had several systems that utilized this framework where we did have what, what you would call CICT, where we had models that were deployed and the time between when a person clicked on an ad or chose not to click on an ad and when that fact had been propagated into a uh, feature update or, or a uh, like a back propagation uh, gradient step for the model that serves ads was less than less than twenty minutes. At abnormal, it's it's going to be a substantially longer period of time because of our auto retraining. Uh, but the there is a very fast turnaround time towards that information being incorporated. But it goes through the aggregate signals. It goes through the fact like this af after this message is sent, we'll extract all these signals from it, update the aggregate. So the features in the next prediction are different. So you can mm -hmm. think of it as like, if you're, if you think of, it's all sort of the same thing when you blur your eyes and take a step back, whether you're applying this update to the features or applying this update to the weights of the model. Uh, mm -hmm. But at abnormal, our, our only real-time updates are being applied to features. Uh, whereas when I think of continuous training as, as referring to the real-time updates being applied to the weights. 